Epstein. I am the Associate Curator of Science and Film here at the museum. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Museum of the Moving Image for I Trusted You, Andy Kaufman at the Edge of Performance. Uh, so for those who haven't been uh, to the museum before, just very briefly, we are the only institution in the US devoted to film, television, and digital media. We show over 500 films a year, often with discussions, including filmmakers and scholars. The series that I create is called Science on Screen. That happens monthly. And we also have three floors of exhibition spaces, uh, which hopefully you've had a chance to visit a bit. Our next big exhibition opens uh, mid-January, and it's about 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I'm going to come back. But more to, the, more to the point about today, I am very, very thrilled that we are able to uh, host and bring you all here for this very special, unique, one-time only uh, event, um, which really is the um, work, I, I, ideas of manifestation of um, uh, Andy Kaufman, but also uh, Brian Hubble, who is a fantastic artist, curator, um, dear friend, who has uh, studied Andy Kaufman's life and work for the past 13 years. Um, and it's really because of him that uh, all of this is possible. Um, so I uh, just want to thank him. I'll, I'll invite him up here in a second. Um, but just a few words about the screening for tonight. So we're gonna begin with some clips of some better known and, and more rare work of Andy Kaufman's intervention <coughs> on live television, which I think will help um, to contextualize my breakfast with Blassie. Um, it's different than what you saw in the cuts for those who saw that. Um, my breakfast with Blassie is a film that Andy Kaufman released in 1983, two years after the title <coughs> My Dinner with Andre that most people know. Um, we're not going to watch the entire of my breakfast with Blackie because we want to leave enough time for the Q&A we have afterwards with two very special pe people who are here, Michael Kaufman and Carol Kaufman. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't be disappointed, for sure you will get a good dose. Um, and, and so just a reminder to please stick around after the screening. And now I'm joining welcoming Brian Hubble to the stage to say a few words. <laughs> Hey, um, I just wanted to thank a few people. I, I wanted to thank Sonia uh, for, for letting me do this and for convincing the museum to um, okay a lot of my ideas. I mean, she let me put a, a laugh track in the bathroom. And <laughs> she said, okay. And I said, oh, well, let me see if I can do this. She really went to bat for us. Um, I'd like to thank Ernst and for doing documentation wherever he is. And I'd like to thank Andrew Buss <coughs> for uh, logistics and a friend of the Kaufmans. I'd like to thank all the performers. Um, you guys did a yeah. And I'd like to thank the Kaufmans, of course. Yeah. And uh, the Kaufmans. Absolutely. Yeah. And just on a personal note, like Sonia said, um, I've been studying Andy's work for the better part of about 13 or 14 years now. And when I started that process, I never would have thought in my wildest dreams that my family would be sitting with Andy Kaufman's family and I'd have a project like this. So your very strangest dreams can come true. And as Andy would do in some of his uh, performances, in some of his theater performances, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming tonight. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Michael and Carol Coffin. <laughs> Anything about <laughs> whatever, or whatever girl, you like. Girl, boy, girl, boy. Hey, it's really up to you guys. Yeah, girl, boy, girl, boy. Girl, boy, girl, boy. Yeah. All right. What do you want to do? Well, <laughs> you know what? Well, I got an idea. 
We'll switch in the middle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, if, if, if one of us has to go to Here's the bathroom, <laughs> yeah. the other one can take the seat. Okay, that's okay. great. Okay. Is that um, okay? That's great. <laughs> okay. I think it should be on. Just speak into it. Oh, okay. Testing? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Testing. Thank you guys for Testing. being here. It works. It works. Wow. <laughs> so, Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just kick this off because I, I'm, I'm a bit of an outsider to all of this. I really um, come to this through Brian. Um, uh, and by this, I mean the sort of a indelible genius of Andy Kaufman. Um, so you have, you know, been deeply immersed, and uh, I'm curious, just if you could tell us a little bit, a how you, you know, entered this world and why, and um, if you have any sort of takeaways after uh, this sure. of years. Uh, I started looking into Andy's work about 13 or 14 years ago. Um, there used to be uh, a video store on Bedford Avenue in Williamsburg. And uh, it's, it's long gone, but there was a, it was a great store and there was piles of videos everywhere. So if you could find what you wanted, it was there. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> So anyway, uh, I found this video on Andy Coffin, and I watched it, and it blew my mind. And uh, I, I, this was before YouTube. Okay. And uh, everything okay out there? Sorry. Okay. And anyway, so I've lost my train of thought already. So, uh, Bedford, uh, the Bedford Avenue, yes. yes. And so I got this, this DVD of Andy and um, kind of just went from there. It was before YouTube started. Sorry, guys. Sorry, everybody. We're gonna. I mean, I'm gonna twist. Or, yeah. Or maybe the time is to go to the bathroom. Should we do the twist? Should we just keep going? No, I remember that. Sorry. Should we just ignore it? So, so Andy Kaufman. Okay. Get him out of here. Okay? It was funny. Maybe he's not okay. Maybe he's like, I don't know. Maybe he's not okay. I don't know. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. All right. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Okay. I guess there's always two. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, okay, so yes. before anyway, YouTube. Yes. Yeah, before YouTube. So before YouTube. Uh, and at that time, uh, you, I, you would join the TV and radio museum. And they had sort of a private area upstairs uh, if you became a member of the museum. And they had everything that's ever been on TV. It's a really great resource. So I sat there for uh, countless hours watching everything I could on Andy Kaufman. And, 
uh, and, and would watch everything that he might be on and the Dick Van Dyke show and of course David Letterman and all this sort of thing. And I'm just going to fast forward through several years of, of, of reading and, and writing about Andy. Um, and I got to the point where um, I was just interested. I'd heard, you know, you'd heard so much about Andy being a genius, uh, but I, I didn't, I couldn't really find too much information um, as to why Andy was a genius and what he contributed to, uh, I guess, the field of, of comedy. And so I began to sort of get a better understanding of that. And I'll just give a quick example of what I'm talking about, and, and then I'll pass it on to the coffins. Um, so take, I guess, the wrestling, for instance, is a really big one. Uh, so when you take something, when you, when you act inauthentically, which Andy was doing during the wrestling, he didn't, he didn't really believe that women should go back to the kitchen and wash the potatoes and you know, all of those kinds of things. This was satire at its highest level. So when you take that way of acting, an inauthentic way of acting, and you find an inauthentic context, which wrestling was and is, I mean, everyone to some degree knows that wrestling is a put on. So when you, when you take an inauthentic way of acting and put it in an inauthentic context and create a, an authentic reaction, it's a very strange math and a very, I find, very sophisticated form of comedy. Um, and what I mean by that is the people who were reacting to this, the authentic reaction uh, was very much authentic. I mean, people wanted to tear his head off. The entire country was upset with him. So no one has really been able, in my mind, um, Andy, has, we haven't heard from him in 35 years. And that's just one example of, I think, there's been a lot of uh, young comics and performance artists and so on who have uh, tried to take performance to that, to that next level. Um, but it still seems unclear to me where Andy's era ends and the next one begins. Basically, he realized that there is no such thing as an inauthentic experience. And he also realized and used in his, in his performances that comedy in particular was just as much behavioral as it was verbal. Um, I, could, I could keep going, but I'm going to pass it. We have a very unique opportunity. Uh, to hear stories from Andy's family, his, his brother and sister, uh, Michael, who I've had the pleasure of becoming really good friends with over the years, and I'm just going to pass it along to them, and they're going to chat a little bit about their brother. Is this on? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Back? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, do you want to go first? I'd like to go first. Oh, well, I got a lot to say too, you know. Oh. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, it's I don't not know. fair. It's not I mean, fair. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me go first. You want to do it the way we? All right, well, let's do it the way we did it. With Andy. With Andy, yes. So the winner is. All right, now thumb wrestling goes way back in our family. <laughs> you ready? So you go one. Uh, one na hockey, two, two na hockey, hockey three, three na hockey. hockey. <laughs> oh, you cheated. You cheated. No fair. That is so no fair. That is so no fair. Right. Usually I cry, but right. not, not tonight. <laughs> and if we were choosing once, twice, three, shoot, whoever would lose would say two out of three, then you go to three out of five, and you just keep doing it until you finally <laughs> win. But this just a little example of the three of us, how we used to be. So, um... Andy, Andy, Andy did most of the pranks on other people, but he also loved to be had. Uh, one example is when we would play Crazy Eights. Everybody know that game? Yes. Yeah. So what we would do is, the, the rules changed so many different times uh, as far as what you were allowed and not allowed to do, but of course we'd always break the rules. So I saved an eight. My, you weren't allowed to use an eight as your last card. I saved an eight as my second to last card, and then I changed the suit to clubs. Andy just keeps taking as many cards as he can so he can get all the eight, the rest of the eights, and he changed the suit to hearts. I happen to be holding a heart. So Andy figured by me changing it to clubs, I must have been holding a club, so by me having a heart, and he got it, that he was duped, and one of the best laughs I've seen him ever have 
he was a good sport in getting duped. So, oh, does that remind you? Yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So wait. So the whole concept, like he would have loved to have been duped more times in his life, but he was too busy creating the experience for other people. Like, was the wrestling real? Was Fridays real? You know, etc. Um, so anyway, so there was this one summer, and um, Andy was home from taxi. I was, I don't know what I was doing home, but like every night we would, you know, go out to eat at Friendly's. And then anyway, so one night we were looking for something to do, and we got to this fair, like on Long Island, and there was this tent set up, and in front of it was this barker that was saying, you know, stop right in and see the woman turn into the gorilla. And um, so I, I knew what was gonna happen. I, you know, I knew what was gonna happen, so I knew that like this was gonna be like a fun experience for Andy. I didn't say anything to him. I said, Andy, let's go in. You know, we'll see the woman turn into the gorilla. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we all knew it was like a setup, right? So um, we go in, it's dark, and we're in the front row, and then the barker comes in, and he's hyping it up. He's like, and now, if you are faint of heart, you know, if you have a heart problem, you should not be in here. And, you know, and Andy's getting really excited, and it's dark, and on this little makeshift stage, there's a woman standing there behind bars, like she's in a cage. And, uh, and then, like, the lights got dim, and there was maybe, like, a mirror. I don't remember exactly how they did it. But you knew that there was some kind of, like, it was some kind of magic trick. And, um, but you were, like, willing to suspend belief to see how they were going to, like, pull this off. Like, but, you know, you knew. So anyway, so we're standing there, and all of a sudden, the woman disappears. And in her place is standing this big, you know, hairy gorilla. And, uh, you know, he's pounding his chest and he's like rattling the bars and, and it's all like, it's exciting because we're like so close. It's a little tent. So like so close to this gorilla and you're trying to figure out, is he really like, is that a good costume? Is that real hair? You know, you knew it wasn't a gorilla. But anyway, so then the barker says, wait a second, something's happening. Something's happening. Something's going wrong. And you know, and the gorilla's like rattling away, rattling the bars. And then he takes the bars and he throws, the gorilla throws the bars off to the side and he lunges into the audience. And Andy and I, we like run. We run <laughs> out of that tent. And everybody's like running out of the tent. Andy and I just keep running and running till we're in the middle of the fairgrounds. And we're like huffing. And then he picks up his head. He, he turns around. And he realizes, like, he's been duped. Like, there is no gorilla chasing him. There never was a gorilla. The whole thing was a big magic trick. And the moment that he realized it, he was just laughing, laughing. It was like treasure. It was gold. You know, to have that experience to be duped by others. How old were you guys, Carol? That, for me, was, um, like, 1978. It was about that summer, yeah, because uh, unless you can help me with this, that's the summer I think it was, the friendlies every night. Yeah, and we get there like, two minutes before we close, but um, <laughs> you tell me how old you are. Oh, so. so uh, asked, how old were you? Now you're 78. So about 22, <coughs> yeah. So if there's anyone who knows math, they'll know how old you are now, okay. 22. <laughs> 22, so I had just graduated, sort of. So that's why I was home from college. So how old were you when you went to uh, see the Rockettes? Oh, okay. So that was, hmm, ah. Oh, do you want to know the number, how old I was, or no, do you want to just, just hear the, the story? Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. That was a, seg a segue, I was doing okay. a segue for you. So, you know, the advantage to, to, you know, to having these kinds of experiences with Andy was, you know, be, before he was like famous famous, he was just like one famous. And then before the one famous, he was like sort of half famous. And what I mean by that is, because it wasn't the age of YouTube, no one's laughing, okay, before it wasn't the age of YouTube, um, you know, you could remain sort of like anonymous, even if you were on Saturday Night Live once and you're on David Letterman once. There was a way that not everybody would know who he was. Like on the dating game, he got away with that. Right. That's right. That's right. That can, you, can you maybe talk a little bit about the history of? I know that he was really trying to get on for quite a while, that's, and it was that was taped in August '78. The first taxi episode was September '78. 
But as Carol pointed out, um, he was on SNL, Van Dyke. So he was he was on a lot of shows, mm -hmm. but it wasn't Taxi yet. Mm -hmm. So he was able to get away with um, being on on the Letterman as Baji Kimran. Right. And by the way, the end of that, I was there that day, and I was when I, while I was waiting for Andy after the show, that uh, the Bachelorette. Um, was being picked up by her mother, so I saw when they when they met, and the mother said, "So how do you like your date?" And she said, "Well, at least I didn't pick number three." <laughs> <laughs> and she had no idea. <laughs> and to and to your point, in terms of um, having some being a little bit of an anonymous person uh, or an obscure person, you, when you have some fame, I understand that even when Andy was on Taxi and at the height of his fame. He, w of course, this was obviously before the internet and before, you know, if you make a move, it's, it's online. He would uh, fly on the, he would, I think, film Taxi during the week or whatever few days that he had to be on set for Taxi. And then um, on his own dime would fly to, to Memphis and wrestle all weekend because he wanted to and erupt a crowd of 10,000 people in Memphis uh, as this other person and then come back uh, to LA to, to tape again and uh, his manager George Shapiro a lot of people didn't like the wrestling as much and he was just really happy that Andy could go to Memphis and go do that and it was really only televised in the south and so it was just kind of an interesting thing that he could kind of have that that thing there and, and George tried to keep it a secret for as long as he could and just one other thing I talked to one of the wrestling promoters uh, a couple of years ago one of the guys who was responsible for uh, introducing Lawler to Andy uh, and he said you know um, Andy never cashed any of his checks either from the wrestling he just it didn't occur to him he just it was something that he wanted to go and do and I thought that was so strange he just didn't care it's like yeah he never cashed any of his checks I don't know what he kept coming here for it's true uh, my father cashed me after any <laughs> 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 I have copies of the checks at home and of my father's letter to Andy's accountant ask, asking to, you know, can he deposit them or get new ones, whatever, but that's all, all true. So. Do you think because it was a dream come true? Oh. It, and he didn't have the heart to do it? Andy had more fun being a wrestler than, I think, than anything else. Which reminds me, I could. I don't know. I, I, I remember like... So who's going to keep yeah. track of the... We yeah. skip, I, I'm on it. We skip You're Rockettes. On. We skip Rockettes. Yeah. <laughs> so we skip because Rockettes. now we got on the wrestling. And um, it, yeah, I remember sitting around the kitchen table. I must have been a teenager. And um, so we would watch the TV, you know, in the kitchens, little TV. And um, he had it set to the wrestling station. And Andy, you know, I remember Andy one day saying to me, Now that, Carol... That's real theater. Look at the way, look at the way the, the, the bad guy is, is strutting around. And look at the way they hate him. And, and, and they're booing him. Look at him. Isn't that beautiful? That's what I want to be one day. Yeah, and from what I understand, I guess Vince McMahon Sr. at the time. Who's that? Uh, sorry. He, was, he like owned wrestling. You know, he just was the wrestling guy. And now his son owns it. Right. And... Andy would kind of hang around and, you know, everyone knew who he was and he was trying to get into it. Um, and I think Vince McMahon Sr. was like, no, we, that's too weird. We don't want to, that's going to be boring, I think he said, and it just wasn't going to work and it was too strange. And then the guy that I had spoken to finally got Andy involved with Jerry Lawler, which became one of the, obviously one of the most uh, infamous uh, uh, rivalries in wrestling history. And Andy was right, you know, um, Right after that, it just blew. I mean, right after that, Cindy Lauper got involved. If if any of you guys remember that, yeah. and then from there, you know, it just became. It went from the lowest form of entertainment to, I guess, what David Robbins, the writer, would call high entertainment. Uh, is and and it continues to this day. I mean, Billy Corgan owns part of wrestling, and you know, for better or worse, Andy opened that door to this very strange context. The year after Andy died. Um, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> um, SNL, you know, they, they, I think back then they were on three times a month. The week that they were off was filled in with WrestleMania. 
Hmm. And that was just one year. Oh. That was like that was '85 when that started. Um, now that same TV that Carol was talking about. So I'm watching on that same little black and white TV in the kitchen, Abbott and Costello and stuff like that. And Andy says, "Michael, you know I'm working right now. You're goofing off." So <laughs> taking notes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what else did you have on that? You had something. Oh, around around the kitchen table. Around the kitchen table. I I feel like dreams. I don't know. No, did, wasn't there something where he told you to, to um, <coughs> you had to talk to each other, but you couldn't use oh, words? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is, for me, it felt like the genesis of stuff around the kitchen table. So, like, Andy Andy would say to me, all right, Carol, let we're going to talk to each other, but we're not allowed to use any real words. So, like, he'd say, okay, I'll start off. Bishkalu. A big a muiki. No, Nikki, Nikki. Oh, no, Nikki, Nikki. No, Nikki, Nikki. Nikki, 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 Nikki. And like we would have all this expression, and it was so much fun. And it was like, I guess this was years before, you know, you know, the language that he really perfected, you know, with his foreign man and, you know, and taxi and stuff. But um, yeah, it was just you know real honor to be there at that table. And um, there was this show in New York. I, I think it was a show. I don't know. It was called the Bowery Boys. And um, so it was like this gang, and there was one you know mean kind of guy. And and anyway, so I don't know why, but Andy and I took it upon ourselves to come up with this voice, you know, to like even melt the heart of this uh, meanie. And so Andy would say. Would you be my friend? Would you like to be my friend? I, I, I need a friend. I don't have any friends. I need a friend. You know, we would just like clown around like that, you know, around the table and stuff. It was just special. It was fun. It was, yeah. Did, did that have any influence on the creation of, of Foreign Man? Or was that more like his Knuckles character? Yeah, or a combo, you know? I mean, could have been like evolved into all that stuff. I don't know if we saw a clip of Foreign Man, uh, people know what, what the, his character on Dating Game, that, we, that was the first uh, clip that we saw tonight, uh, was sort of that, that character, which was also a character that he did on Taxi, for those who've seen that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Knuckles is the character who was on um, his WTTW special, where who got in a fight with the puppet Tony Clifton? Um, we, we didn't see that tonight. I don't think mm -hmm. we didn't get the Tony Clifton tonight. Right. Tomorrow, Tomorrow night. night. Right. <laughs> um, so I. Um, so wait. What? Do you want rockets or no, do you, no, no, or no, do you no, want? You well, I was going to talk about when I. I I oh, saw, yeah, 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 I yeah, said, yeah. Andy, too bad you're so famous. Yeah. So I had, I'd have a great idea, but you. you so now he is too famous to have this thing mm. work. So he said, well, why don't you do it? I'm a boring accountant. And <laughs> so I, I, you know, it was, it was foreign for me to be on stage. But when Andy says it, you do it. Because you can't fail if Andy's on stage with you. There's something that would just happen. Um, felt like he was like embracing you and holding you up. And so I think for both of us, it just gave us confidence um, that we wouldn't otherwise have. I also think that we weren't aware what people really felt. <laughs> well, I was aware this night because what happened was um, I posed William Patterson College, April 29th, 1982, and I supposedly was the person who toured the country with the Broadway, with what became the Broadway show Pippin. But a week before it was to open, I got into a car accident and damaged my larynx, my whatever that was up here. And um, so John Rubenstein steps in and he gets all the credit. So now six years later, and he's giving me a chance. Um, so I sing the song from Pippin, Corner of the Sky. And the people aren't sure by the third or fourth note whether they should be embarrassed, whether I'm whatever. So they start like, you know, putting their hands over their mouth, they're smiling, they're, um, I had handed out these flyers earlier, they, they fold the rooms up into paper planes and started throwing them at the stage. They, when they threw a coin or coins, Andy leaned over and said, please don't throw anything hard. 
It's like, keep throwing, but just don't make it hard. Um, and pretty much, uh, it was a lot of laughter and booing and throwing and all that stuff. So at the end of the song, Andy says, ask the audience, who wants to hear another? <laughs> and a thunderous ovation. I've never heard such a great thunderous ovation when he said, who doesn't want to hear another song? And he looks to me, well, you heard them. What are you going to sing? <laughs> and I dedicated Perry Como's And I Love You So to the audience. The entire song filled with poos. <laughs> Carol, maybe you can, I um, would request, if I, if I may, that you tell us the hypnotist story. Oh, you mean Park West, 1982? Yeah, Park West. Oh, you, you want to hear that? Please, you know, really? I thought I was going to do it. Yeah, tell me to put sure. you in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we decided yeah. that we didn't think it was a nice story. <laughs> All right, well, Andy's a complicated yeah. right. uh, So 1982, Andy's in Chicago, and um, what was... What was fun, you know, was he would do his shows, and, and if he was in my town, I, I live in Chicago, he'd say, Carol, you want to be in my show? <laughs> and I'm sure you got that too. Well, yeah, you got those opportunities. And I never turned them down. I mean, I don't know. To me, like, I, like we said, we were under Andy's wing of protection. I also think that we just weren't aware of what the audience was really thinking, and it didn't matter to us, because it wasn't our reputation. <laughs> so... Um, so anyway, so Andy uh, has um, in his show The Masked Magician. So what The Masked Magician is, is his buddy, and he's dressed up like the, uh, a, hypnot a, a magician, who um, an evil magician, who gives away all the old great master, you know, magic tricks, like the big rings, and you know, he's, so he's giving them away, you know, you, you should never do that, right? And then the Masked Magician says, and now I will hypnotize three people on stage and uh so he picks us from the audience you know and it looks like you know it's it's like a random thing but like i know i'm going up there because andy asked me to so um so there's me in the middle and then there's a guy on my left and then there's a woman on my right and um so he does the masked magician he does his hypnotism and so he hypnotizes the guy next to me and he says and you, when I snap my fingers, will pick your nose and eat it. Oh. Yeah, it was really, and he did. He did. He was like on a continuous loop of picking nose, eating, picking nose, eating. And, um, and then he said to me, and you will sing, was it like, like Ethel Merman? Or no, no, Hello, Dolly. It was Hello, Dolly. So I was on this loop singing Hello, Dolly, you know, and I, you know, I, sh I don't sing, so it was very authentic, you know, because I was off tune. And, um, and then on my right, there was someone, um, so I was in my 20s, and there was someone on my right that there's, you know, a gal, um, she was also in her 20s. Princess Cheyenne. Oh, oh, so we're telling who she oh, is. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Oh, my God. Maybe she's dead now. I don't know. So she yeah, we shouldn't talk about yeah. her. Um, anyway, do you want to say that she was his friend and she was also a plant or not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, is that going to ruin the story? Or? I think it would ruin it. Yeah, um, it's a long time. All right. Okay. <laughs> what about the part that she was a stripper in Boston? And her station nope, is nope, Princess nope, Cheyenne. Nope, 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 nope. No. Okay. Any of that. Just and, and if they met during meditation, they were both vegetarians together? <laughs> <laughs> Pretend that she was just out of the audience. She didn't know what she was getting herself okay. into. So she was just an innocent person chosen. <laughs> and, um, and so then the masked magician says, and you, when I, when I snap my finger, when I count to three, you will take off your blouse. You know, and, and so he counts to three, and she takes off her blouse. So now she's just wearing her bra and her underpants and her, her regular pants. And then he says, and now you will take off your pants, you know. So now she's on stage just wearing her bra and her panties. And um, now Rick would know this story. See, I wasn't really looking to see how far it went, but Rick says... That she, my husband, that she, because she, yeah, because he says she kept her panties on, but the masked magician said, take off your bra. So now she's on stage, half naked, 
And, um, you know, these people that pay money, you know, going to the Park West was, you know, a place you go see stand-up and musicians and nice shows. And, you know, you could tell it was a little awkward because Joe was picking his nose and eating it. I was singing like, you know, Hello, Dolly. And the Princess Cheyenne, her stage name in Boston, was half naked. And um, then all of a sudden, you know, enter from the back, uh, the exit from the lobby, comes in Chicago police. You know, like in real Chicago police, you know, it was no Halloween costume, it was real Chicago police, you know, like they were packing. And they went up on stage and they took her away. And it was really uncomfortable. It was really uncomfortable. Go ahead. But they let the show go on. No, 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 no. The show didn't go on. I stopped singing. Joe stopped picking. And um, and then what happened? And then, like, the audience was like, no, don't take her. No, she didn't know. She didn't know. It's not fair. Don't take her. Don't take her. And they took her away. And um, I think maybe somebody threw, like, her clothes to her, you know. And, uh, and then we all looked to Andy, like, Andy, do something. Do something. Like, get control of your show. And, um, and like the curtain went down, and it was really awkward. And, uh, and then the curtain opened and there was this like table and Andy was sitting behind the table with a telephone and um, he said, well, should I call the police? Do, well, what do you think I should do? Should I call the police? And they said, yeah, call, get her out. Use your name, your influence, you do something. And, um, and so he got on the phone, you know, he said, hello, um, you know, this is Andy Kaufman and um, you just you have somebody down at the precinct and and I, I'd like to clear this up she really didn't know and you know and and it was really awkward and I don't think she ever came back I mean I don't think he ever said really I'm only kidding I don't remember that I don't remember that but I do have a, um, a cassette tape of it you know I do have a like a little cassette tape because there was a there was a big name radio star Steve Dahl and um, everybody in Chicago knew Steve Dahl, and he, I guess Andy had asked him to be part of the show, or he wanted to be part of the show, and he was drinking, like they gave him like water and beer in this box. Oh, you, 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 know, you resonate with this. So the whole time during the show, <laughs> no, because of the stuff you had out there in the lobby, sure, he I'm with sat you. in the box <laughs> the whole night, and all he did was like drink like beers. He said he had beers. And um, he, look, he had to go to the bathroom, and he couldn't go to the bathroom, and he ended up peeing in his pants. I didn't do any of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, but you know, Andy was known to like take things. Well, you know, whatever. Okay. Do we want to add to that? Because like now you can tell them that she's really a stripper from Boston. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. She really was. So I do want to leave some time for audience questions. Should you folks have them? So. Is there anything you want to say first? I was just or, going to say, yeah. so you rather do um, the questions, or do you want to hear about when Andy? What's the time? No, no, just. Oh. Yeah. Or do you want to hear about the time when Andy went to visit this girl who was dying of cystic fibrosis and never told anyone? I want to hear that. Oh, that one. So Andy so was in think Chicago. About it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andy was in Chicago. This isn't and a joke. joke. Actually, I, I believe you saw him. That night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came to visit me. And he had a flight to Washington, D.C. that was postponed, delayed, postponed. And there was a, he had a pen pal, pen pal maybe once or whatever. Um, and he, so he knew this um, girl, Mary Jean Burden, who lived in DeMott, Indiana, <clears throat> and who was, uh, had cystic fibrosis. Um, so, he, so he saw that as an opportunity to rent a car he called her friend, she arranged for a bunch of people to meet at the hospital. Where I don't think she was actually in the hospital at that moment, but she, her mother drove her over and they all met at the hospital. Um, and Andy showed up around midnight. Um, he immediately went over to Mary Jean and you know, told her not to be nervous. I'm a, I'm, I'm a person just like you. He sang Love Me Tender to her. 
he even wrestled at least two women that night, and I, I do have photos of that, and he let them beat him. It's the only time he ever let them beat him. And um, uh, he stayed till two o'clock in time to, uh, to uh, get his plane the next morning. And so this, so if you can't see it, I'm sure. This is a copy of the thank you note that Mary Jean sent Andy, along with a letter, just parts of the letter is like, just the way she's able to relate to him. Hello there, friend. I'm still pretty excited about that evening. I took, you know, everyone is amazed when they realize, when I show them the pictures, who you are. I'm starting a savings account. Save money so I can have, have it to come out on to, to see you in California. This is from Indiana. This is giving me something to aim at. And I want to thank you for that. I know you're doing this secret you told me about. That's amazing. They told her a secret. Um, I also know you are a special person to take time out to do what you did, says that. Um, and she signs it, love, Mary Jean Burton. Uh, this is the article. And how do I know any of this? Because Andy kept all this stuff. He never told anyone, but he kept um, all this. And... Uh, Never wanted anything for you know, and he's like, oh, isn't he a good guy? Obviously, he he didn't go for that. He just went for doing something from his heart to this uh, girl. And here's the letter from her mother. So this is April third, nineteen eighty one, and on May twenty sixth, the mother writes, "Dear Andy, just a couple of lines to thank you for taking the time when you did to brighten a sick girl's life." I've read this so many times. And I still get moved every time I read it. Mm. I'm Mary Jean Burden's mother and wanted to write you. Mary Jean passed away May 19th, a week earlier. But she really enjoyed your visit and showed the pictures to everyone. I'll never know why with your busy schedule you took the time to come out and cheer her up. Words could never say it up. You'll never realize how much you helped her. Thank you again for being the kind of person you are, Mrs. Barbara Burton. And, um, you know, I like telling that story because of um, how Andy was misinterpreted for being, for being so free on stage. Um, the wrestling, the Tony Clifton, all that, you know, the, there was misinterpretation of what he was like in real life. Um, this is an example of what he was like in real life. Any, anything, you know, when they did, when they did um, the movie, when they did the comedy salute to Andy Kaufman, um, everyone who I met who knew him had nothing, even Jerry Lawler has nothing but great things to say about it. What a nice, you know, nice boy, you know, gentle boy, and, uh, um, you know, golden boy, that was okay. So anyway, so um, so it's almost like my mission to correct the myth. It's almost like, like at the expense of ruining the myth, it's, I like to correct it um, for who Andy was. Do you want to repeat the question? Um, no. Oh, oh um, no, no, you repeat the question. Oh, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Can you answer the right, question? Right. All right. Uh, the question was, we haven't heard much about Tony Clifton today, and um, she's curious about how that character was developed. Yeah. I'll say what I, and you have something to add, you can, but a lot of people take credit for um, the creation of Tony Clifton. Um, the story is, that when he was um, in Las Vegas, can I do this, Maria? So when he was in Las Vegas, <laughs> in July, actually on July 19th, 1969, wow. <laughs> he um, went to a B lounge and saw this singer who was awful, who didn't know he was awful. 
And Andy said, that's a good character. <laughs> and Andy happened to meet Elvis on that same visit, meeting actually hidden, he hid. In a in closet. The, in the closet of the kitchen. For, he stayed there for eight hours. And, um, and, and what did Elvis say to Andy? Andy, he, Andy had his book that he had written about Elvis. Okay. And he, uh, well, 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 what Andy had done, uh, the story goes that he, he had just gotten to Vegas and he had no money. He's very young, maybe 20 something years old, 20? Uh, 20. About 20. 20. And um, he had gotten to Vegas because all he wanted to do was meet Elvis. And he had, he had figured out somehow that Elvis and the Memphis Mafia, I think is what it was called, Elvis's entourage, would go through the kitchen area before they, to go on stage as to avoid the public. And Andy had um, become friends with a busboy or something and said, hey, look, I, you know, I really, you know, this is the one thing I want to do. I want to get Elvis to sign my book. I would at least want to know that, him to know that I've written this book about him and I love him. And he had developed this like friendship with one of the busboys who, and somehow cajoled him into letting him say, okay, so this busboy, I guess, put his own job on the line and hid Andy in a closet in the kitchen and said, I don't know when they're going to come by, but you can stay here all day and good luck is more or less what I understand. He, he, and he, he waited in the dark in this closet for seven or eight hours with this book in his hand, a hand, handwritten book that he wrote about Elvis. And um, sure enough, the Memphis you know, Mafia, I think it's the Memphis Mafia. I think, does anyone know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. They come through, and Andy opens the door, and uh, a couple of Elvis's guys, like, you know, try to protect him. And then apparently Elvis goes, whoa, 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 I'm not going to do an Elvis impersonation. <laughs> uh, but he says, you know, hold on a second, let me see what that young man has to say. And he just said, El you know, Elvis, I love you, and I wrote this book about you, and that was God. The name of the book was God. Yes. <laughs> and I just wanted to tell you that I, that I love you and that, you know, you mean the world to me. Um, just kind of how I feel about Andy. And uh, he, you know, Elvis said something along the lines of, well, that's, that's very good, it was something very simple. But Andy took that as very much a blessing. And it gave him the inspiration to, as the story goes, to, you know, his Elvis impression, which Elvis later said, you know, out of all the people who ever did an impersonation of Elvis, Andy, Andy it was his favorite. And it was because Andy wasn't trying to be funny when he did Elvis. He loved and wanted to emulate Elvis. Um, and that's part of the Dada spirit of some of his humor that we won't have time to get into. But that was the story of, of mm -hmm. him going to Vegas and meeting Elvis. So on that same trip, Andy's daughter was born. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she's here tonight. And she's here tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And about 20 years later, his granddaughter was born, and she's here tonight, <laughs> Brittany. <laughs> and Brittany played Carol as a little baby in Man on the Moon. So anyway, Tony Clifton. Um, so that's so that's where the idea first came, and the pe the people who claim being the inspiration for the character are Richard Belzer. And my father, our father. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know of any, uh, any, anyone else claim that? I don't. I, I know those two. Um, you know, the, you know, the ornery kind. But anyway, but, but Tony Clifton, there's another myth, you know, like, um, is that he was actually, he may have been brash and ornery and all that, but he was also vulnerable. He wasn't filthy, like, it's, like what's happened to it in the per past 35 years. Um, Andy Tony Clifton was beautiful. He was a man with a dream. Mm. That is how I read Tony Clifton. And one of the few times, uh, it may be on YouTube, where, his, where he was very gentle was, if you ever are interested in seeing it, is when he went on the Miss Piggy show and was very sweet and nice to Miss Piggy. And or, or, or Carnegie Hall, when he reads right. a poem, A Wife. Mm. This is a beautiful... Poem. So for those who don't know what we're talking about, uh, you're, you can you can look those those like some yeah. other. Um, you too. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Another question? If you raise your hand. Yeah, right here. Oh, um, Nathan. Just we're at the That's museum. Nathan. Nathan loves Andy. Yes, I do. <laughs> just because we're at the museum of the moving image, I'm wondering uh, 
if or do you know or uh, do you think uh, some of Andy's bigger film ideas will ever get fully realized? Like Andy once said, he wanted the Huey Williams story to be an epic as long as Ben Hur. And also, he, I know that Universal still owns the Tony Clifton story, which he also wrote. But do you think any of those will ever be fully realized? So will any of Andy's film ideas be fully Let's realized? See. Um, do we, if I say that's a great question, is that good enough? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really is a great question. Um, I would love to see the Healy Williams story, but, but how do you, that has to be more of a serial. You can't make that into a movie. Yeah, and the Tony Clifton, only Andy could do it. They, in Andy's career, they, uh, there was some talk I've, I mean, how many people, I'm not sure how many people have ever read the Tony Clifton story script. Maybe me. You know, I don't know. But it's, brill it's a brilliant, weird, strange script. And, um, the big wigs at Paramount at the time um, had decided to make Heartbeats, which is probably another movie that no one's ever heard of or seen that was made, that Andy was in, that didn't do so well. Point being, uh, people at Paramount lamented um, you know, years later, and said we should have made the Tony Clifton story instead. So, who, who, you know, I never thought I'd be standing up here with them. So maybe the Tony Clifton story will be made someday. I don't know. Okay. Anybody else in the middle there? Yes, you. Uh, yeah. So it's, it seems like to me that uh, Andy Kaufman created a new lane of comedy that. Makes people uncomfortable, and I was, and like a lot of people draw influence from him now. Was there anybody that he was influenced by to like start that, like, or was was there anybody that he <laughs> idolized? I guess besides Elvis. Uh, well, that was that's it's really it's Andy um, in in terms of him being a, a very um, people talk about a lot about his innocence and. I think the, the, he really truly did love, and it, and, and it was no satire involved with Elvis. There was no satire involved with Halatunji, the, the man who he wanted to emulate when he played the bongos, or the congas, rather, or I don't know. So I really do believe that was, I believe that th those were the people that Andy looked to. He didn't, know, he didn't know what Dada was, for instance. He was friends with the artist Lori Anderson, and she would jokingly say, you know, Andy, you're really a performance artist. And Andy would kind of jokingly, you know, sprout around and say, I am a performance artist. <laughs> and he didn't really, in, within the context of contemporary art, he didn't really know what that, what that meant. He, doesn't, he didn't know or care anything about Marcel Duchamp or their predecessors, The Incoherents, or their predecessors, Watteau. He wasn't really aware of any of those things. Uh, so... Or, or, or the people at, who were working at the time as performance artists like Vito Acconci and Allison Knowles. I think it's, I personally find it, you know, a breath of fresh air that Andy um, was just, he it, it was just being Andy. Right, so um, there is an interview where Andy does spout off a couple of um, old time comedians. I forget who they are, so I don't, I don't even want to say it. Oh, what about Steve Martin? I mean, that's Steve Martin, Steve, Steve Allen. Allen. Yeah, Steve Allen. right. But right. yeah, so, so there are several of them. But what stands out for me right now is he loved Fellini movies mm -hmm. because you never knew if you were dreaming or not. And that sounds like oh. Andy. Um, Grandpa Paul. Um, Soupy Sales. Yeah, Grandpa yeah. Paul. How do you do that? You know what that is? I, uh, I don't know. You're the, the, uh, our, our paternal grandfather. Um, <laughs> so it really is Grandpa Paul. Um, Did you see me nod my head like yeah, that? Yeah. He was a, you know, like, he would always be, all right, at Andy's Bar Mitzvah, held at Grand, the club that Grandpa Paul was a member, all the men's golf shoes got unpaired. They were all neatly in front of the lockers in pairs, and they got rearranged, and Andy's friends got blamed for it. <laughs> so it was Grandpa Paul. <laughs> That's better than Marcel Duchamp. Okay, we have time for just one. And, Andrew. Go ahead. I, I just you want to tell a little anecdote that you, you, you will remember. At the premiere of, of uh, My Breakfast with Pelasi, 
and Andy was late because he was coming in from LA. And at the end of it, he went to the projectionist and said, you know, I was late. Would you mind playing the cartoons for me? <laughs> and then we sat and watched the cartoons. Oh. <laughs> I just thought that was so cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there in front in the white center. Um, be because you mentioned you wanted to correct something about Andy's image, um, Sonia may have told this story that I told her. Uh, my mom, who's here, who ran the movie theater where Andy used to go. Oh, and um, I had no idea that she knew him, and I know, I'm quite sure she didn't know he was famous. And um, one day, I would work at periodically in the evening as a cashier, and it was very quiet out, and nobody was on the street, and Andy walked into the movie theater. I was like, wow, Andy Cox is here. And he's looking around, and he just seemed sort of puzzled. And then he came back out, and kind of looked around, he went back in, and he looked around again. And then he came back out, and he came up to me as the cashier, and he said, do you know if the lady manager is here? I said, I'm sorry, she's out to dinner. And he said, do you know um, when she'll be back? I said, well, it might be two hours. And he seemed a little frustrated. He went back in, like maybe I wasn't telling him the truth or something. And he looked around again, and then he came back out to me, and he said, I just wanted to tell her how nice she always was to me. And that was so moving, but what made it even more moving is I didn't realize he must have known he was dying because six months later he died. Oh. And he just went out of his way to come to the movie theater and tell my mom, thank you for being nice to him. Oh. Oh. Thank think, you. Wow, thank you very much. Brian, you told me something that Andy used to do in movie theaters. Or maybe right. Michael, you told me. No, oh, oh, Carolyn. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Right. I remember Andy telling me he loved um, popcorn, you know, theater popcorn, butter theater popcorn. And uh, there were times he just really wanted to get the popcorn. He didn't want to see the movie. <laughs> maybe, he had, maybe he had already seen the movie. So he would just, so he would have to buy a ticket. He'd go into the concession stand, buy the popcorn, and then he would leave the theater. <laughs> And he, and he could yeah. actually go to restaurants and order appetizers only. You know, he, he, they were, that's what appealed to him. He ordered as many as he wanted. He didn't have to order the main course. That's, he was free everywhere. I yeah, everybody's at well, yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe one more. Somebody has a great question. Yeah. Raise your hand. I can't help but think that the gentleman who was ushered out that was laughing uncontrollably <laughs> is probably the biggest Andy Cotton fan here. <laughs> Okay, well, great on that note, fiction. thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Michael and Carol.